My name is Adeline Peter Rayboff, and uh, I come from Nitsukwich Inn uh, area in in um, among the Gwich Inn people, and and uh, the the information that that is on this map um, is primarily uh, gleaned from my father. My father was an oral historian uh, and also a genealogist. And it was just amazing working with my father uh, because I didn't start off working with him. You know, I gathered pieces here and there from the time I was about 20 years old. He later on, you know, when I, it became such a problem for me to keep up with everything, I, I actually worked with him for a period of about 10 years whenever he came into Fairbanks and I would work with him. And I actually lived in, in Arctic for a whole year um, working with him. Once again, re reacquainting myself with my own language because uh, you know I speak which in, but I speak it like a teenager. Like I, I'm not as proficient as someone who, who would have grown up in, in that area all the time. And uh, so I had to go back uh, and, and relearn, you know, tenses and so forth and, and listen to uh, words that I didn't understand and, and uh, rework that. My father helped me in terms of uh, the genealogies and timelines and uh, when, when certain things were happening in somebody's life. My mother, uh, who is Catherine Peter, uh, is actually, you know, if you take which in literature uh, written by which in people, she is beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know, one of the, uh, one of the only people actually who, who wrote in which in. The volume of work that she worked on, just about everything that's written in which in nowadays has been uh, written and trans or translated in by my mother Catherine Peter. This map was uh, made with the help of uh, Jeff Rasick at uh, uh, the National Park Service. Uh, he's head of the Gates of the Arctic National Park Service. I had various versions of this map before, but this is much more uh, uh, in detail. He got some people from National Geographic to do the map. And so that each section of the map that you see, you can actually, you know, if you're able to, you can zoom it, you know, make it really big and it will be, you know, GPS accurate. So uh, that's, that's pretty amazing, I think. And, and it took us over a year and a half, almost two years actually, to, to do this map because we, you know, like uh, sometimes it was, you know, the, he had to get the right people to do the map. You know, this, this is like an estimated distribution of people, of, uh, of the, the native groups in, in Northern Alaska. And it's not all of them. And a lot of it is from uh, Ernest S. Birch Jr., who uh, did uh, a very in-depth study of uh, the Northwest Arctic. So this is, this is the, all the, the Inupiat that you see on the map is from his work and his study. And uh, from, you know, like numerous interviews that he did and uh, research that he spent years doing. Uh, and, and then the Koyukon and the Gwich'in parts are, are gathered from the Gwich'in, uh, like from Osgood and all these old anthropologists. And, and then when we get to the interface, with the Koyukon people, you have the Nindahe and the Sikil. And then one of the things about this map, there's Nindahe, and then there's a Sikil, and then there's the upper Selawik. And that group actually was in, in uh, the Koyukon Athabascan Dictionary, but I didn't pull it, kind of sloppy on my part, not to have uh, found that and put it in there. 
uh, but this map just really represents a lot of research. And, and so sometimes your mind just kind of goes, ah, <laughs> it's enough already. And the reason I want to share it with everybody is to show that Alaska Native history didn't begin with uh, the Russians coming and with the Americans and with the English. Uh, Alaska Native history was going on much more before that. And, and so uh, this is basically where we were uh, in, in about 1800. And of course, uh, the, the interaction of um, uh, new trade goods, uh, you know, changed the whole uh, uh, dynamics of uh, Inupiaq Koyukon interaction, uh, Koyukon Yupik interaction, and uh, Koyukon uh, in and Lower Tanana uh, interactions. I want to share this map with as many people as uh, I possibly can, because it represents something that that can be done for the whole state of Alaska. And, and uh, for instance, in Yupik country, there's, there's just not one Yupik area. There's community after community, and they all had different dialects. And, and this should be brought out. I've worked on it for years, and I didn't work on it by myself. I worked on it uh, here and there with all sorts of people. So it's not an individual thing that, that that took place. Um, so I want to share this with people to let them know that, hey, we do have a history before uh, 1867. And people have to dig around for it, but it's not lost. It's not completely lost because there were so many things that were written about, about uh, uh, by explorers and some naming individual people. And th this has been really helpful. You know, the fact that individual people have been named. Now, the second thing about this map is that it represents for me uh, the starting point for writing uh, a history of, of uh, the Northern Koyakon, the Nindahe and the Sekirhutana and the other group there, the upper uh, Selawit group. Uh, further south, there, there are also Koyakon people, but I, I, that's way out of my range of, of, uh, of knowledge or even understanding. But the reason I know about these, the first three groups here in Northern Koyakon, which abut the, the Inupiat communities, I'm descended from Northern Koyakon. I'm Nindahe, um, and my, my dad was, and, and my great-grandmother was. And my great, you know, like going up back, you know, like I'm, I'm the seventh generation that that we that my dad and I have been able to, to follow. The first three generations were actually living in Nindahe, uh, in the Upper Noatak, and and uh, and then also later on in the Upper Kobuk. So this map represents the starting point for writing the history of the, the Northern Koyakon, the Sekelhutana and the Nindahe. And in the case of the Nindahe, their movement eastward. And in the case of the Sekelhutana, moving south. You know, to me, this map represents uh, um, the, the beginning of writing the history of the Northern Koyakon, which does not exist. And oh, it includes the Tulova too, the, the Headwaters people. I have read everything you can think of that, that, that has been written about this area. People have helped me also uh, with stories that they, they happen to think would uh, interest me. The, the assumption for, for many people is that, you know, like uh, people just live in one community and they don't go back and forth. The truth of the matter is, is that all the, the native Alaskans travel great distances and they do it, they did it, you know, sometimes yearly, sometimes uh, maybe not so often, but they, they went to 
local trading centers. Uh, they interacted. They were multilingual. You know, like uh, if you lived down on Lower Yukon, you were speaking Yupik and Inupiat and Koyukon, and and uh, you're probably speaking Dena'ina. You know, that's the part that that uh, a lot of outside researchers don't don't understand or appreciate. A lot of the people in in uh, the Yukon River between Tanana and Nalato, most of those people, and Stevens Village actually, most of those people are Sakilhutana. They came from the Upper Kobuk, and uh, the people you know between Galena and Downriver, uh, a lot of those people were also come from. Uh, the Selawik region. I'm concentrating on the, I mean, the three northern areas, the Mindahe, the Tuloga, and the Sekilhutana. I know where these, you know, these families ended up. And also uh, through 23andMe and uh, the Ancestry.com, uh, I've found, you know, a lot of relatives in the Upper Kobuk, which I'm not surprised by. And then uh, we have a lot of relatives in in the uh, McKenzie River area, and and that's not a surprise either. There there were a lot of surprises about the the research and the people who have helped me. You know, a lot of them are no longer living, and and uh, I wish that I could have shared more with them when when they were living, but. Um, this will be for their kids and for their grandkids. And a lot of those people that I worked with, you know, they encouraged me to do this. And they said that they, they wanted their grandkids and kids to, to see this. Okay, so you have there the, uh, uh, the brush fences. And, and usually the brush fences in, in the caribou fences. Uh, the brush fences were, were where they had uh, uh, willows. They... Uh, would represent people sometimes, uh, like instead of building a big cairn, because sometimes it's not not an area where there's there's a, a lot of rocks. You can see where there's, like in in Ned's Igwich and country, you see where there there's a lot of uh, brush fences, so they were easy. Uh, they could be built anywhere, but the 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 other fences, you know, the the rock ones. Uh, these are much, much older. And as a matter of fact, the Park Service has some of these dated. And then they include blinds where, you know, rocks have been piled up and there's a blind. For instance, in Onoktuvik Pass and in Howard Pass, the wind is so strong that people cannot stand up. So they need to have some kind of shelter and those rock lines, uh, you know, were only about, uh, what, maybe three feet high, but they were enough so that you could crouch down there and save yourself from 60 miles an hour winds when it's uh, 40 below. So that's, they were lifesavers. But uh, the rock cairns and the corrals there, a lot of them are really old. But the ones in Anaktuvik Pass, for instance, you know, uh, most of the Inupiat elders who are no longer uh, alive, they said definitely and for sure that they did not build the, uh, the, the caribou fences, the Nuksuk, uh, that were in that area that the Indians did it. So yes, it's true, you know, the Tuloga did build those. I think it's important to, for people to realize that we that Alaska Natives do have a history because uh, for so long uh, we were discouraged from knowing our own history. You know, they'd say, oh, don't talk about that. You know, that's uh, legendary, old belief systems. And also, you know, people were so, um, when the diseases started coming into the region, a lot of people died. And so, so much was lost and they ended up in, in mission houses and, and being raised not to think of their history as being important because they, they wanted, you know, Native people to learn English. They wanted us to 
learn Christian ways. Uh, so much uh, emphasis was put on that. People lost a sense of identity. Identity is very important as far as where you came from. And uh, I'll tell you just a short story. Uh, one time I was living in, in Los Angeles, California, and I was living there for quite a while. And one day I got up and I realized that I, I just didn't know what I was doing with, with myself. What, what purposes did my life have? You know, like I, I felt unimportant and unnecessary. So when I felt that way, I said, well, I better get back to Alaska because I have something to do. So I came back to Alaska and, and I'm so glad I did because it gave me a sense of, of belonging to a community of, of people, you know, who've experienced very, very many of the same things that I have in, in my lifetime. I want people to order this map so they can just study it and take a look at, at uh, the way uh, these northern communities uh, were distributed and what the terrain looked like. It may or may not translate into uh, the same kind of thing in, in their area, but all over Alaska, you know, there, there weren't just one group, as I said earlier, that lived in a region. There was always conflict, but um, I, I don't want people to say, oh, well, I don't wanna order this for, for the uh, tribe or for the school district because it's not about our area, but it might not be about your immediate area, but it's the whole of Alaska. And I feel that history books have to start changing in Alaska. We have to uh, say, well, look, we had a history and, and it should preface the event of exploration, the event of the Alaska Native Claims Settled Act, uh, the event of uh, uh, fur traders and gold miners. These are all stories that are told from the perspective of uh, uh, European Americans. We need more perspective from the Native Alaskan experience because we were here. Some areas of the country, they could never come up with a map like this because they've been just so downtrodden and so run over and bulldozed. Uh, but we're still able to do this. And, and it's not too late for, for other uh, regions to start doing something like this. And uh, I really do hope that people uh, text or email uh, Jeff Rasick and, and ask for these maps because they come in packets of uh, 50.